Immigrants, what are they good for? They're dirty, they're lazy, and they're trying to steal our jobs. What happened to America for Americans? These are just a few of the slurs the Irish heard when they began arriving in the mid to late 1800s. Once they came ashore, they found there were virtually no jobs. The few establishments that had openings hung signs that said, no Irish need apply. Eamon Lynch, a descendant of 19th century Irish immigrants, has written Light of the Didicoy about Irish gangs on the Brooklyn waterfront in the early 1900s. This is his first book in a trilogy about the experiences of the Irish in the first decades of the 20th century. Okay, we're here at uh, Rocky Sullivan's with Eamon Lynch. How you doing, Eamon? Good, good, good to see you. you. Uh, author of this great new novel, Light of the Diddy Coy. Um, so let's, let's talk about, I guess, let's talk about the title first. Tell us what a Diddy Coy is, what Diddy Coy means. A Diddy Coy is, um, in Ireland and in, uh, in parts of England as well, uh, uh, there are Romani gypsies. There's a culture right. of Romani gypsies, uh, travelers, they call them tinkers. Pikeys are sometimes derogatory uh, names with a, in a derogatory way. Um, Diddy Koi is a uh, particular kind of gypsy that is mixed blood. It is not 100% Romani. Mm -hmm. So not only are they considered an outcast by settled society, they're also considered an outcast within the gypsy community. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, kind of where I got the idea from this because uh, we're talking about um, uh, the, the, the men that are in the gang, uh, the young men in the, that are in the gang are very, um, they still feel very close to Ireland, mm -hmm. but they live in another country. And uh, in the community of Irishtown, which was uh, uh, just next to the Navy Yard and the bridges, at that particular time there was a very, uh, th there, were, uh, there was a lot of feeling of spite towards Anglo-America. Um, it was uh, very troubling to be Catholic. In uh, in Brooklyn at that time, in New York, everywhere, um, and they were cons they considered themselves outcasts as well. Not right. only from the Catholic, the uh, from the regular Irish working class community, mm -hmm. uh, but from uh, what they saw as New York as being a very Anglo American right. uh, dominated culture. Okay, um, and this is set in 1916, a year very, really important in Irish history. Why did you choose that year? Um, but even a step back, why write historical fiction? Why pinpoint these particular people in this novel? Um, well, it comes down, I think, to my family. Uh, my family, my, my grandparents, when I was, I don't know, uh, 14, 15 years old, they started telling me about a place called Irish Town mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, which nobody really knew much about. You know, back then, there were people didn't have computers like they do now, so it wasn't so easy to look it up. But it wasn't an established neighborhood that right. we would knew, know about today. Uh, so it wasn't until uh, about four or five years ago that I started looking up things about Irish Town, and luckily there's a lot of people on the on the internet these days that talk about their families and their parents and their grandparents in mm -hmm. Irish Town, and um, I, and I learned a whole bunch about it. So I've been writing about it ever since. I cannot forget that old home I left in the town of great renown. I long to go back to that old-fashioned shack in dear old Irish Town. Irish Town was once a place in Brooklyn similar to the Five Points. And the White Hand Gang in 1915 and 1916, they had their, uh, their headquarters here at a saloon at 25 Bridge Street. On the second floor was where the, uh, the gang leader would, would run the racket. His name was Dinny Meehan at this time. Later on it would be Wild Bill Lovett and after that it would be Peg Leg Donergan. But it was a place that my grandparents told me about when I was a kid. Uh, they said there was a place called Irish Town, and even though it's not on the map, it did exist. And it was a place where a lot of the, the famine Irish from the Great Hunger, they had settled in this neighborhood right here because they were too poor to go to places like uh, Minnesota or Connecticut. They had to settle right here in the, in the neighborhoods that birthed them from the ships. Well, let's talk about 1916. 1916. What happened in 1916 okay. that was so important to the Irish? 
1916, obviously, in uh, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, the Easter Rising happened on April 24th. Um, very, very uh, important time frame. Um, in this book, um, I kind of connected a few things, which was my family's background in New York and my family's background also in Ireland in County Clare. So, um, so what happens in, uh, in August of 1915, there's a, uh, a funeral for a man named O'Donovan Rasa, who was primarily uh, in New York. He'd been, uh, he'd been sent away from Ireland by the, by the British police. Um, that funeral happened in Glasnevin Cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, in the book, uh, Liam Garrity, who is the uh, narrator, yeah. the protagonist, he, uh, his father goes to that, uh, that funeral and decides at that point that he needs to send his son to New York to work with his uncle because what's going to happen is there's going to be a war coming, a rebellion in Ireland. So in order to safeguard his son and also to hopefully so that his son would bring his uh, mother and two sisters to New York with him, he sends his youngest son to, uh, to New York. Yeah. Um, so well, the Easter Rising is a very important aspect in this book. Uh, yeah. It's a very important aspect. It's the turning point in the book as well. Although um, you hear about the Easter Rising happening mm -hmm. from the New York side. Right. Um, actually, Liam Garrity and Denny Meehan are in Greenwich Village right. uh, when they find out about it. And there is a huge party happening suddenly in the middle of the street. Yeah. And um, a young 14-year-old boy learns about what happens. Uh, what happened through the newspapers and through other gang members in Greenwich Village is they have a big bonfire on Hudson Street and everybody's throwing their aprons and everything into the fire and having a festival and drinking, you know, uh, uh, kegs of beer. Uh, so it's at that point that he realizes, uh, Liam Garrity realizes that he must bring over his mother and sisters. Right. So he must decide on getting his uncle to help him, who was a member of the International Longshoremen's Association, or getting the gang to help him. Mm -hmm. He wants his uncle to help him. He desperately wants his uncle to help him so he can happen. keep it in the family. But unfortunately, his uncle was not interested at all in you know, Irish rebellions and Easter Risings. Right. Um, so what year did your, your parents, or I guess your, your grandparents or great-grandparents come over here? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, let's talk about that, you know, when your grandparents came over here. And, how they all it seemed to steep you in Irish history. Mm -hmm. My great grandparents uh, Thomas and Honora Lynch both came from County Clare. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they came from Cool Mean and Killadysart, Killadysart, uh respectively. But they didn't meet until they arrived in New York. Mm -hmm. They went to a County Clare ball in um, in New York City. Um, but they came over in the 1890s. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my great grandfather, Thomas Lynch, had a very tough time of it. He was six foot four, though, so that helped him out to get uh, labor jobs. He was always picked in the, in the labor lines. Yeah. Um, but he was, a, uh, he was a sand hog at one point, working mm -hmm. for uh, the Belmont Company. And he also um, uh, worked in saloons and as a longshoreman. So eventually, they, he opened up his own saloon in 1906 on the corner of Hudson and Barrow Street, and it was called Lynch's Tavern. Yeah, that's wild. Um, and what role did the, the church play back then? You know, because it's pretty tough to separate mm -hmm. the Irish from being Irish Catholic, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, my great grandfather and my great grandmother were very Catholic. They were uh, practicing Catholics. Um, uh, they went to church all the time. As a matter of fact, back in those days, I heard stories all the time from my grandfather about how they. Uh, they, they did mass in, um, in Latin at that yeah, time. Right. And my grandfather was fluent in Latin still at the time. He lived into his 80s, mm -hmm. uh, luckily enough. And he still spoke Latin and went to a church um, in his local community mm -hmm. uh, that, that did in Latin. So that, uh, I, I grew up uh, as, a, as a practicing Catholic. Everybody in my family was Catholic, and I was expected to follow, and I did as a, yeah. as a child would. Yeah. Um, Catholicism was in New York at that time still in 1915 and 1916 considered a lower grade religion. It was right. considered uh, popish. It was, uh, it was negative. There were negative stereotypes still connected to Catholicism in Brooklyn uh, at that time, although there were a lot of Catholics there. But let's talk about the, the need for gangs because when, when people came mm -hmm. over here, they really, there was nothing, no one else to turn to, right? So, I mean, was there a need for these gangs? And are we looking back at gangs in maybe the wrong way? I mean, tell mm -hmm. us why gangs were important. At that time in uh, New York City and in Brooklyn, 
there was really not much of a social safety net. Right. But there was a huge amount of poor. Right. I mean, the poverty was very terrible. I mean, children were dying uh, at a regular rate of colds, mm -hmm. uh, just normal things. Um, so, you know, places like Tammany Hall, which Terry Galway is, has been writing about recently in his book, Machine Made, mm -hmm. um, uh, he makes the argument, and I make the argument as well, um, that uh, places like Tammany Hall, but in my case, gangs, were necessary because uh, people would gather along ethnic lines right. and um, do you know, things that were often illegal in order to feed their families. Right. And to me, that is a form of, I mean, it, it, it's a form of necessity. Yeah. It's not a form, uh, it's, it, it wasn't like these kids were uh, well-to-do kids and, right. uh, and, and they just did it because they liked to, do, liked to break the law and liked to break windows. It wasn't like that at all. It was right. because they were trying to feed their families, right. uh, trying to get their families the medical help that they would need. I mean, God forbid, if somebody uh, was born with some kind of disease, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you can't really take them to the hospital. There wasn't yeah. a whole lot of insurance available uh, to, to the poor at that time. There wasn't uh, something like Medicaid or Medicare uh, to help uh, kids and elderly and anybody who got sick. I mean, uh, so you, they really had to pool together to do certain things. Oftentimes, they did things that were illegal. Right. Um, to me, that has always been a strong part of the entrepreneurship in America. Mm -hmm. It's the basis of it. Gangs were the, the, the very basic level of the uh, culture of entrepreneurship here in, in the United States, where you will do anything to survive, right. anything to succeed, uh, anything you have to. I mean, when, when you're faced with a situation where I mean, maybe your mother or father who had raised you and your four, five, six, seven siblings, mm -hmm. and suddenly she uh, becomes sick, or she or he, your mother, mother or father, I mean, you're willing to do anything to help her. If the social safety net isn't there to help people, people are going to do whatever they can to help themselves. All right, that's, that's good, because I actually wanted to point out, maybe get you to read uh, a small piece that actually addresses that question. Yeah. Um, and before we do that, you want to just say a few words about who Dinny is and who this, uh, the, the, the suite is, and then we'll have you okay. read this. Okay. okay. So uh, Dinny Meehan is the leader of the White Hand Gang mm -hmm. uh, around, from around 1913 to 1920. Uh, the Swede is one of his right-hand men. He's a, he's a very tall guy. He's about six foot five. He has blonde hair. He's actually not Swedish. Right. <laughs> But all the Irish guys think he's, they call him the Swede because he has blonde hair and right. he's real tall and thin uh, and, and has a powerful build. Uh, so they're uh, two of the main gang members. And Liam, obviously, is the, uh, is the narrator. He's got to tell 14 the 14-year-old narrator. Yeah. It's somewhat difficult to explain, but Denny Meehan knows that the world is not watching him, knows the world doesn't care about him, even disapproves of him. Still, it appears to me sitting next to him, there are many men and families that rely on his hand and his maneuvering. The weaknesses that Dinny Meehan has are of, are of a nature that men like the Swede are unaware exist. Yet it is these weaknesses that summon the truest sense of honor I have yet to see among these men. The weakness of caring. <laughs> So the way it worked is the, the gang's headquarters is around the corner from here uh -huh. on the waterfront, and there's also a waterfront down that way. Right. So the ships would come in, they would pull in. Longshoremen and labormen would unload the ships right onto uh, uh, freight rails, mm -hmm. and they would come right through these neighborhoods, and people lived here. Yeah, People wow. lived here. They'd come right through the neighborhoods, but nothing could get unlo unloaded in this neighborhood unless the White Hand Gang was aware of it. Denny's gang. Denny's Meehan's gang, the White yeah. Hand gang. So, so if anything was unloaded or a ship came in that we didn't, that, that they didn't know about, there would be a fight or there would be a fire. Right. One of the two would definitely happen one way or the other. When the White Hand gang was uh, in charge of this neighborhood, they had cranes that uh, after the ships were unloaded right here on the water, they would go straight over into this area and the cranes would drop off the coffee and tobacco right into these uh, shuttered windows. Now the shutters are mostly gone now, but the uh, the older uh, Roman-styled windows are still there. And it would they would go right in there, and there would be uh, uh, men up there just taking up. Uh, they would have their uh, bail hooks. They'd just push them right into the warehousing units, right from the 
from the ships right into uh, the uh, Empire Store's warehousing units here. Let's go back to uh, the narrator, Liam. Did you see, how much of yourself did you see in him? Because, you know, he'd learned so much from the, the older generations is basically what you did. So, I mean, is that, well, talk, just talk about that. Did you see him? Uh, see myself see you as and him? Liam? Yeah. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, uh, I did have some struggle. When I was uh, 14, 15 years old, I went through uh, some tough time with my family. Um, mm -hmm. I was homeless for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived in what what you would call a flop house. There was a bunch of other teenagers living there. Yeah. Um, and the parents were gone in a different area. I don't know where they were. Um, so I went through a time period where I really had to fend for ourselves. Um, we actually did some things that were not illegal, but in order to eat, mm -hmm. you know, we did that. We got fed at school. Right. I, I never missed any uh, high school. and I graduated yeah. on time and everything like that, which is something I was always proud of. But, um, but I struggled at some points in there. Um, uh, struggled with homelessness uh, when I was a, a young teenager, mm -hmm. but you know I got out of that. Uh, did I see myself as as Liam? Sometimes I did. There is a scene in here where he was, where he is homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, he's kicked out by his uncle. Right. It's freezing out. It's snowing. He doesn't have any food. Gets his jacket stolen. Yeah. yeah. And there was a time period there um, in my life where I actually did um, uh, experience starvation. Mm -hmm. um, so. Some of the experiences that I had with starvation, I explained right. in the book. You know, right. the, uh, you know, kind of seeing a little bit of hallucinations, mm -hmm. um, just really hungry, so hungry you're ready to take, right? Take, you know, and just steal, and ready to just go with anybody that will help you, help mm -hmm. you to put together a plan. And that's what happened to Liam in the story. Is he, he got, you know, Vincent Marr finds him on the street and says, right. "What are you doing? You know, are you, are you homeless? You know, yeah. you're living in a flop house on Flatbush. You know, so." Uh, he goes with them immediately because he senses that they're, they're going to feed him right now. Right now, he just wants a meal. That's his mm -hmm. immediate mark, is yeah. to get a meal. Right. And, uh, and so, yeah, yeah, there, was, uh, there were quite a few things about, um, about Liam Garrity that I found in myself when I was that age. Yeah. Well, how did you get back on your feet? I mean, if you were homeless, how did you, you know, because you're, you're doing very well. You, this is the third book you, you, you've written. You know, mm -hmm. we'll talk about the other two in a minute. Mm -hmm. But how did you uh, kind of reorient yourself? Um, through the help of some friends, mm -hmm. I had uh, some friends that helped me get back on my feet. Um, all through high school, I was—I uh, I didn't miss much class at all. Right. I mean, I was very dedicated to my uh, to my education, and I was even on the baseball team for right. for a period of time. Um, but um, uh, my uh, my family helped me out a little bit. Different people in my family helped yeah. me out, and. Uh, Eventually, I was uh, my mother got sick mm -hmm. when I was uh, 17, right. and I moved back home to help right. her to go through her um, to go through her period. She eventually uh, succumbed to cancer uh, right. at that point, um, but it was the probably one of the the best times in my life. Strangely enough, because yeah. I got to know her in a way that was mm -hmm. very personal, very personal. Um, she went uh, back to the Catholic Church at that point, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I did everything that I could to help her with her suffering, yeah. and, uh, and and that included helping her get to the church. At that point, um, I was a little frustrated with the church. After mm -hmm. my mother passed away, I felt like um, the world made people who were good mm -hmm. suffer the most. Right. Um, and I went through a time period where I was really challenged by that. Right. Um, or because my mother, who was a saint to me, you know, right. everybody's mother is a saint. Um, I saw her suffer, and I saw her die. And uh, that was very difficult for me to accept that that was God's plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I went through a, a number of years where I, I, I was very challenged mm -hmm. in going back to the church, and I, and I refused to. Um, as I get older, I, I start seeing things in a broader perspective. Let's talk about you, your other two books. You have a novella and, and you have a book of poems. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about those and, and do you think that they were kind of building blocks that helped you write this full novel? Mm -hmm. They certainly were. Um, I've actually written another book too that never has been published. Mm -hmm. I, I never sent it anywhere. Um, but An Affair of Concoction was the first one that I had that was, uh, excuse me, An Affair of Concoctions was the first book that I put out. Uh, it was a short novel. Um, my second book was a book of poetry, and uh, that's when I started leaning towards, um, uh, th there are some references to uh, Irish poems. I right. actually uh, rewrote uh, Spancil Hill, which is a song, and I rewrote it in another poetic form. 
um, as, is, as is tradition with that song. It's changed throughout time. Um, so I started getting back to that. There's also references to my uh, great-grandfather's saloon mm -hmm. that was taken over by my grandfather and, you know, life in Brooklyn. So that kind of got me started. Um, uh, 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 but, I, but then in 2009, mm -hmm. I really started to feel like, I, you know, uh, I wanted to write about something that was extremely important to me or close to me. Right. And that happened to be, you know, my my Irish background, mm -hmm. uh, background in uh, New York City, and uh, in the fact that my parents, uh, my my parents and grandparents were born and raised in Brooklyn, right? And uh, the Irish connection to that uh, in in Irish Town, uh, which is uh, uh, in the Vinegar Hill area, and the history of Ireland that I had grown up with in my family. My my grandparents um, always had. Uh, Tim Pat Coogan's books laying around for me to, sure. to sift through. Uh, always had um, books about the great hunger uh, that happened. And, uh, and these were things that, uh, growing up as a kid, I was a little confused by them because I never learned much of anything about the great hunger whenever I was in school. Well, yeah, you want to talk about that? Because I think there's a lot of misconception of the so-called famine or, or hunger. So tell us about that. Uh, the Great Hunger, which is uh, commonly, if not erroneously, called right. the Potato Famine, mm -hmm. um, which it actually was not a famine at all. There was a famine on potatoes, but there was a lot of other food in Ireland in the 1840s and early 1850s. Um, but as laissez-faire was very popular at that time, Adam Smith's uh, 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 economic and political philosophy was very popular in London at that time, and London was in charge of everything that happened in Ireland. Um, they said, hands off, you know, let the, uh, let the Irish fix the Irish problem. Right. And, and all that they did, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trevelyan, who was in charge of funds uh, allocated to Ireland at that time, they did small things to make it seem as though they cared or make it seem as they were trying to help them, the workhouses and the soup kitchens and the road building. Um, in reality, uh, the quotations from him, who was in charge of getting money to Ireland, were that, you know, the Irish are a lazy, disgusting people, and they don't deserve it, and they're just, we're just going to create, as we mm -hmm. see now, right. a culture of dependence. Right. So um, that uh, is really kind of uh, uh, the seeds that are sown in, uh, in this book, Light of the Diddy Coy. Uh, it is in the back of the mind of every Irish Catholic in New York. Right. Um, the reason why they're in New York is because of that, uh, uh, of that great hunger that happened where over a million died and over a million were sent abroad. So um, in that way, they were like gypsies. They were treated like gypsies, mm -hmm. like Diddy Coys, just sent out of the country, get off the land so we can, uh, we can graze cattle on, on the lands. That's what the landlords were thinking. And, uh, and go somewhere else. Um, fortunately, America embraced them um, eventually, and um, you know we made our lives here. Mm -hmm. So the Great Hunger is a very important aspect in this book, just just as any other Irish American book would be, uh, in, in the fact that they 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 feel like outcasts uh, being in New York. So this is the the first book uh, of what's going to be a trilogy, correct? Yes. Um, yes. And what are the time periods going to be covered in the next two books? Uh, the second book will take us from uh, April 1916, right after the Easter Rising, right up into about uh, 1918. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the third book will go uh, right up to March, March 31st, uh, 1920, which is the beginning of Prohibition. Right. It's kind of a symbolic turn yeah. um, in New York, whereas the, uh, the street gangs mm -hmm. um, after Prohibition didn't have as much uh, sway on the streets as did uh, organized crime. So it kind of switches from the old school Irish street gangs to the Italian kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, organized crime family rackets in 1920. So uh, symbolically that's when this book in the series will end. Mm -hmm. If we had more time I would talk about the use of language in here which was really mm -hmm. important and it's not contemporary language, it's language from that time period which was really important and you develop these voices mm -hmm. uh, that I really liked. Yeah, you know, but that's, thank you. Uh, that's another discussion. But Eamon, thanks a lot for coming in. Thank you for having for, me. For, for doing this.
Oh, I'm cold. Are it's you? available yeah. inside. It's yeah, all right. In, it's, uh, all right. So it's definitely uh, get inside and I'll sign it. Uh, it's right in the... Around. We, I guess we should have them here, you think? But ask him where it is and thank you. <laughs> you might want to bring some more out here. You can always bring it back.